Good day everyone, welcome to the first video lesson of two for chapter six of the Foundations of Scalable Systems. In this lesson I'm going to focus on distributed caching. Caching is one of the treasures of the available techniques available for building scalable systems. In fact, distributed caching is an essential ingredient of any really scalable system. Caching makes the results of expensive queries and computations available for reuse by subsequent requests at low cost. By not having to reconstruct the cached results for every request, the capacity of the system is increased and it can scale to handle greater workloads. Caching exists in many places in an application. The CPUs that you run your applications on have multi-level fast hardware caches to reduce relatively slow main memory accesses. Database engines can make use of main memory to cache the contents of the data store in memory, so that in many cases, queries do not have to touch the relatively slow disks. There's two flavors of caching that I cover in chapter six. In this first video lesson, I'll describe application level caching that requires business logic to incorporate the caching and access of pre-computed results using distributed caches. In the next video lesson, I'll talk about web caching. Web caching exploits mechanisms built into the HTTP protocol to enable caching of results within the infrastructure provided by the internet. When both are used effectively, they will protect your services and databases from heavy read load traffic. Application caching improves request responsiveness by storing the results of queries and computations in memory so that they can be served by later requests. For example, think of an online newspaper site where readers can leave comments. Once posted, the articles change very infrequently, if ever. Hence, an article can be cached on first access and reused by all subsequent requests. In general, caching relieves the database of heavy read traffic, as many queries can be served directly from the cache. It also reduces computation costs for objects that are expensive to construct, for example, those needing queries that span several different databases. The net effect is to reduce the computational load on all of our services and databases and create headroom or capacity for more requests. Caching itself requires additional resources and hence cost to store cached results. However, well-designed caching schemes are low cost compared to upgrading the database and the service nodes to cope with higher request loads. As an indication of the value of caches, approximately 3% of the infrastructure at Twitter is dedicated to application level caching. At Twitter scale, operating hundreds of clusters, this is in fact an awful lot of infrastructure. Let's use an example to show how caching might work. As you can see on the slide here, at a busy winter resort, skiers and boarders might want to use their mobile application to get an estimate of the lift wait times across the resort. This enables them to plan and avoid congested areas where they'll have to wait for a lift ride for say 15 minutes or, as you can see on the slide here, sometimes a lot more. Application level caching exploits dedicated distributed cache engines. The two main technologies in this area are Memcached and Redis. Both are essentially distributed in memory hash tables designed for arbitrary data representing the results of database queries and downstream service API calls. The basic scheme is shown here on the slide. The service first checks in the cache to see if the data it requires is available. If so, it returns the cached contents as the results to the, re to the request. This is known as a cache hit. If the data is not available in the cache, a cache miss, the service retrieves the requested data from the database, writes the query results to the cache so it's available for future clients, and returns the request results to the requester. Going back to our skiing example, every time a skier loads a lift, a message is sent to the company's service that collects data about skier traffic patterns. Using this data, the system can estimate lift wait times from the number of skiers who ride a lift and the rate at which they are arriving. This is an expensive calculation, taking maybe a second or more at busy times. For this reason, once the results are calculated, they are deemed valid for five minutes. Only after this time has elapsed is a new calculation performed and results produced. This code example shows how a stateless lift weight service might work. 
When a request arrives, the service first checks if the cache has the results that it requires. If they are in the cache, the results are returned immediately to the requester. If the results are not in the cache, the service calls a downstream service which performs the lift weight calculation and returns them as a list. These results are then stored in the cache and returned to the client. Cache access requires a key with which to associate the results. In this example, the key is constructed with the string lift wait times, concatenated with the resort identifier that is passed by the client to the service. This key is then hashed by the cache to identify the server where the cached value resides. When a new value is written to the cache, a value of 300 seconds is passed as a parameter to the put operation. This is known as a time to live. It tells the cache that after 300 seconds, this cache value should be evicted from the cache. As the value is no longer current, it needs to be replaced and it's called stale. While a cache value is valid, all requests will utilize it. This means there's no need to perform the expensive lift weight calculation for every call. A cache hit on a fast network will take maybe a millisecond, much faster than the lift weight time calculation. When the cache value is evicted after 300 seconds, the next request will result in a cache miss. This will result in the calculation of new values to be stored in the cache. Therefore, if we get n requests in a five minute period, n minus one requests are served from the cache. Imagine if n is 10,000 or 100,000 or a million. This is a lot of expensive calculations saved and CPU cycles that your database can use to process other queries. Application caching can provide significant throughput boosts reduce latencies and increase clients' responsiveness. The key to achieving these desirable qualities is to satisfy as many requests as possible from the cache. Application level caching is also known as the cache aside pattern. The name references the fact that the application code effectively bypasses the data storage system if the required results are available in the cache. This contrasts with other caching patterns in which the application always reads from and writes to the cache. These are known respectively as shown on the slide here as read through, write through and write behind caches. With a read-through cache, the application satisfies all requests by accessing the cache. If the data required is not available in the cache, a loader is invoked to access the database and load the results into the cache for the application to use. For write-through caches, the application always writes updates to the cache. When the cache is updated, a writer is invoked to write the new cache contents to the database. When the database is updated, the application can complete the request. With write behind caching, we basically have the same as write through caching, except that the application does not wait for the value to be written to the database from the cache. This increases request responsiveness at the expense of possible lost updates if the cache server crashes before the database is actually updated. This is also known as a write back cache and internally is a strategy used by most database engines. The beauty of these caching approaches is they simplify application logic. Applications always utilize the cache for reads and writes, and the cache provides the magic to ensure the cache interacts appropriately with the backend storage systems. This contrasts with the cache aside pattern in which application logic must be cognizant of cache misses. Read through, write through and write behind caching strategies require a cache technology that can be augmented with application specific handlers to perform database reads and writes when the application accesses the cache. An example of this is Anim Animason's DynamoDB Accelerator. This sits behind the application code and DynamoDB and transparently acts as a high speed memory cache to reduce database access times. One significant advantage of the cache aside strategy is that it's resilient to cache failure. 
In such circumstances, if the cash is unavailable, all requests are handled as a cash miss. Performance will suffer for sure, but services will still be able to satisfy requests. In addition, scaling the cash aside platforms such as Reddish and Memcast D is straightforward and simple. They're just simply distributed hash tables. For these reasons, the cash aside pattern is the primary approach seen in massively scalable systems. In the next lesson, I'm just going to briefly describe how our applications can exploit the infrastructure provided by the Internet and the HTTP protocol to provide web level caching. Thanks for watching.